We've been speaking with top economists about what this economic climate means for companies' bottom lines. Today, I'm speaking with economist Dambisa Moya. Dambisa, thanks so much for joining us. Thank you, I'm delighted to be here. You're currently serving on the boards of multinational companies like Chevron and Condé Nast. What's the biggest threat to companies' bottom lines right now? To my mind, the most important thing that we ought to be thinking about is growth in the medium to long term. So there is always a temptation to think about tactics, things that are going on in the here and now. Risks around economic growth are the ones that we really ought to be focused on. And I'm worried in particular because both developed and developing economies are struggling to achieve that 3% per year growth rate, which is required in order to double per capita incomes in a generation. So we're going to break that down a little bit. Why is that 3% growth so important to everyday Americans? Well, clearly, um, the whole hope is that we're continuing to improve people's livelihoods and people are able to access opportunities, not just in terms of public goods like education and healthcare and quality infrastructure, but also being able to improve their livelihoods by access to great opportunities. But we're not able to deliver on that. Um, public policy can't deliver on that, and nor can corporations if the economy is not growing. The important role that corporations can play in terms of being a tax base, in in terms of innovation and delivering goods and services plays a key piece in improving livelihoods over the long term. Think of it as the pie shrinking. It means our ability to deliver these public goods is quite hamstrung, but also people's ability to improve their living standards, whether it's job opportunities or access to different and new experiences becomes quite limited. Probably related to this decline in GDP growth, why is productivity growth slowing in the US and why should we care? Well, it's a great question, and I think just to frame it, because a lot of people will say, well, what is this productivity thing? It's basically the unit amount of output an individual contributes to GDP. So how much output am I putting out? That number is very important. It's about 60% of why one country grows and another one does not is because of productivity. So it's got a huge impact, in fact, a majority impact uh, as a contributor to growth. The reason that it's really important is that we would expect that individual's ability to contribute contribute to the economy would increase in a world of technology because our ability to do things in a much quicker way, access information in a much faster way uh, is enhanced. But what we found in the data is quite the contrary, that over the last decade or so, many uh, developed countries in particular, but also some emerging market countries have struggled to actually get that productivity number up. And so there are a lot of questions. This is a very big puzzle. I've written articles on what might be happening and why it is that we haven't seen these big productivity gains that we would hope to see from a technology boom. But I think a lot of that right now, um, we hope, is chalked up to measurement, meaning that there are new sectors and new jobs and new opportunities and new information platforms that have emerged from technology. And unfortunately, our modeling of productivity in the economy have, um, have actually not kept up. There are lots of estimates now that AI could really be a massive uh, contributor to productivity gains. You bring up AI, that's the next thing I wanted to talk about. So how is AI going to change the way that companies do business? And what does that mean for employees? Are more people likely to lose their jobs or are we all more likely to be more productive? This topic of AI um, has, is, is really fever pitch now. Um, in all the areas that I inhabit as my work, as an investor, as an economist, as a board member, as a public policy person, I think it's a longer game than perhaps people are, are thinking about. But at the micro level, it could have a meaningful impact, not just on business models and how companies constitute themselves and think about allocating resources like capital and labor, but also I think it could be incredibly transparent transformative for the role of state. If indeed we end up with a lot more people who are out of work, which some estimates assume that that might be the case, we might see as a new role of state and obviously a real challenge to what the role of corporations is, given that on the, the 2019 Business Roundtable pledged to revamp the role of corporations to not just think about financial shareholders, but to think about stakeholders broadly. So in a world where more people are out of work, we have to think about how society is growing and this laborless growth model 
there's a lot more questions that will emerge around AI. And of course, I have not even talked about the risks to the downside. My thesis is that we're going to see a much closer relationship between the public sector, including the third sector, the NGO sector, and corporations. At least that's what we would hope to see, because I think ultimately we all should be pulling together to have better outcomes for economic growth, but better outcomes for, for society. I want to shift gears a little bit. How has inflation influenced how companies spend and what would an effective board advise? Very simply put, you have the supply drivers and the demand drivers. The supply drivers uh, for our purposes would be things like supply constraints emerging from the war on food and fuel. Obviously, China's now back. For a long time, they've been quite constrained, and so supply chains were also very affected. On the demand side, we were sitting at home for the uh, pandemic and the quarantines. We came back and demand increased, that we know, and that obviously has led to a big spike in inflation across the board. We are now in a world of a higher, some would argue, better priced capital. The cost of capital is, is more reflective from the abnormal rates that we saw before the pandemic. I would argue that higher cost of capital has definitely uh, dampened uh, demand pressures uh, and de dampened inflation on the demand side, but there clearly are still risks on the supply side as the war continues to rage and there are real issues around food and fuel, particularly as we will go into the winter months. We certainly saw a lot of de-risking of corporations. Last year, many companies left Russia, reduced and, and de-risked their portfolios. And so in that respect, I would say, although there are ongoing risks to be mitigated, I think that uh, a lot of that risk was sort of taken out um, in uh, 2022. So I want to switch gears a little bit. Will the U.S. see a recession this year? If not, why has the recession stalled? I would say that we've clearly not ended up in a recessionary environment in the U.S. Other countries are in recession, like Germany and many other countries around the world, far from the 3% that we need to grow. So our emphasis needs to uh, evolve into thinking more strategically about how to jumpstart growth and to make sure that we can avert longer-term challenges that emerge from a low-growth environment. The 1929 crash, it took about 25 years to pull the economy out of that economic slump. And so because of the pandemic, because of inequality, because of technology and the risk of a jobless underclass, the demographic shifts that the world is facing, we're missing a bigger issue, a bigger question, which is around whether or not the U.S. and the global economy more generally are now headed into a multi-decade period of slow, low, and even no economic growth. And that, to me, is the bigger issue. All right, broadly, uh What's the best advice you would give a struggling company right now? So I think the companies that will survive have great balance sheets. I know that sounds very easy. I think the estimate now is about 14% of U.S. companies are zombies, meaning they don't even generate enough uh, cash flows to cover their interest, which uh, is quite worrying, especially in an environment where interest rates are, are as high as they are and potentially could go higher. And to also not really delay aggressive cuts to where you're investing, how you think about investments and adapting to a lot of the changes that are happening in technology, which could really help to faster reach your customers, but also reduce some of the costs are all things that are, are very important for a company that's struggling to survive.